Today is November 21st, 2015, and we're going to start with prayer and then get into discussion. Heavenly Family, once again, we want to thank you so much for your love and for giving us so much life and truth and righteousness and really everything that we could ever ask for. And thank you so much for the meeting last night and bringing out certain principles uh, that are so important to understand. Thank you for the wonderful Sabbath that we just had as well and increasing our understanding of the truth. And I um, just want to ask that tonight you guide us in our discussion. Mm -hmm to go to the right areas, the things that you want us to focus on, and help us to understand these truths that perhaps we haven't before, or to um, have principles brought out that we need to be reinforced in our minds. Heavenly Family, thank you so much. Guide us, Sister, and uh, we thank you, Father and Mother, in the name of your children, Branch, he and she. Amen. Amen. Yeah, so I was thinking, one thing that I wanted to mention at the beginning of tonight's meeting is that there were a couple really good meetings that we've had here recently uh, in which we have talked a lot about the principles behind different aspects of truth. And... One was last night, and then the other one that stands out in my mind is from, I guess it's a couple of weeks 6th. ago now, November 6th, okay, yeah, um, when we were talking about faith and works and some of the things related to that. And in both of those instances, the conversation started simply by someone here asking a question. You know, in the first instance, Rebecca had asked the question, and in, uh, last night, Leroy uh, asked about uh, previous discussion and so on. And it kind of sprung from uh, aspect to aspect, but all starting with a question being asked. And I think that it is so important for the benefit of all of us for questions like that to be asked. And... So I just really want to encourage everyone, you know, when we come here to the meetings, if something comes to your mind to ask, to ask it. And it may end up leading to a, a, an entire study on certain principles and so on and so forth that might be really helpful not only for yourself, but for everyone in the group. And... Um, yeah, so wanted to mention that. And with that said, perhaps we should just see if anyone does have any question like that. And we can kind of take the same approach that we did last night in, you know, if anyone has questions about the message in any regard, that that can be addressed. Or if someone wanted to share something that they've been reading in regard to the priestly law or investigating in regard to the Dead Sea Scrolls or other literature, um, then that can be done. So we'll just leave it open now if anyone has anything that they want to say or even anything about last night's meeting or further clarifications concerning anything we've discussed recently. Um, this is Rebecca. I have um, a comment that I'd like to make, something that has come to my attention the last several days. And sure. I really appreciated you going over the principles last night because one of them that I had forgotten that I need to be reminded of because my mind has not always been directed that way is the one in which we're to prove all things by the natural realm. So this week I was reading 
I started Genesis again, and I was reading in Genesis, and it gives the seven days of creation. And I was thinking as I was reading that, that that's easy to prove. All I have to do is go outside and look at all the wonderful, beautiful things that God has created for us. But my question was, how do I prove the Sabbath is the seventh day? Now, I realize that the Jews keep the seventh day, and it's always on Saturday, and they know what day it is. But is there another way that I could prove that that really is the Sabbath day, that seventh day? Sure. No, that's that's an excellent question. So how is it that we can actually show materially? In other words, like we talked about last night, not just the statement of belief, but demonstrating it materially. So that's an excellent question, and that's something that is important, um, especially for anyone who might have doubts in that regard. So having family guide us as we uh, approach that subject. So basically, one thing that you mentioned already actually is one way to show it materially, uh, the fact that the Jews have been keeping it over the past, well, even over 2,000 years um, in an unbroken chain. There's never been a time where there hasn't been Jews keeping the Sabbath throughout that whole period of history. Um, however, it's not dependent on even Sabbath observance at all to show when the seventh day actually is. Um, and what, what can be done in that regard is there's a, quite a number of different cultures all around the world who have had a seven-day cycle for all of their history. In other words, there's no evidence for them having anything other than a seven-day cycle. And they have continued that seven-day cycle on and on and on, and they also have that same seventh day, what we uh, in this modern society call Saturday, um, as the seventh day of the week. And there are times where certain societies have changed that. There's been some cultures that have tried an eight-day week, and I believe that at one point a ten-day week was even tried, but those were only in very uh, local situations, and they ended up reverting to a seven-day weekly cycle. And also another thing that I think is significant in showing that is some people like to say, oh, well, Romans changed the calendar and so on. Well, all you have to do is simply go outside of Rome outside of the dominion of Rome, go to peoples who weren't influenced by Rome. And for instance, in Ethiopia, they uh, refused the influence of Rome for many, many centuries and kept the, the seventh-day Sabbath and the, the seven-day weekly cycle uh, continuing on. So all of those things are historical realities that can be demonstrated. Um, there's also other things, like there's something that Teresa had mentioned before um, about how in the Gospels it talks about Christ being risen the first day of the week. Well, people ever since the early 2nd century, possibly even late 1st century, certain uh, so-called believers in Christ started uh, keeping Sunday observance, first day observance, in memorial of the resurrection of Christ. Well, that shows that that's the first day. And they have, you know, the history of Christianity since then has preserved what day is the first day. And if you know which day is the first day, well, then you know which day is the seventh day. Um, so that's another another aspect of it. So it's primarily yes, a, a historical point. question. Yeah, sorry, that's a very good point there. Thank you. I needed that one. 
Yeah, I thought that was an excellent point too. Yeah, depending on what people group we are trying to witness to will determine what approach is best to take. And another thing that I think is very helpful in that regard is simply the fact that the burden of proof is for someone making a claim that Saturday is not the seventh day. That's actually where the burden of proof lies. So, for instance, when, any, when anyone makes a claim, they have the burden to prove that claim. Any positive statement, that carries the burden. So if someone was to say, oh, well, Saturday isn't really the seventh day, then they would have the burden of proof to show that. Or even if someone was to say that we don't know, if they make the positive declaration that we don't know that it's really the seventh day, they actually have the burden to show that, especially since in uh, the common world and modern culture today, Saturday certainly is the seventh day, and that Jews have kept it, so you'd have to actually show in some way that it has indeed changed. And someone correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't there um, several cultures with different languages that they name the days of the week, and for the day that we call Saturday, their name for it is, you know, whatever it is, but in their language it means seven or seventh or something like that, right? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, that's another one that I would think would be a good point to bring out just for a, an added witness that um, it's not just our culture that identifies Saturday as the seventh day or whatever. Um, but the, way, the weightiest one right now, especially for someone who believes in Christ, is his resurrection on the first day and how most Christians observe Easter Sunday. One of the widest spread languages, Spanish, calls it Sabado. Yes. I think. Yeah. Yes, the, thank you very much. I think the Russian language even has a word that is uh, for Sabbath. Sounds like Sabbath even. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think most languages so far as I'm aware... Uh, call the seventh day of the week that we commonly call Saturday. Uh, they have some sort of word that sounds very much like Sabbath, and even you know Shabbat in Hebrew means seven. Like it's it's the seventh day, and that uh, most cultures have something very very similar to that. I just found a website called Beyond Today, and there's an article that's called um, Names for Saturday in Many Languages Proof Which Day is the True Sabbath. And interestingly, it says that in more than 100 ancient and modern languages, the seventh day of the week was named Sabbath or its equivalent. And then they give a list of names for the seventh day of the week, Saturday, in 24 languages in which the root word Sabbath is still easily recognizable. And just for example, in Arabic, it's Sabet. In Armeni Armenian, Shabbat. Bosnian, Subota. Bulgarian, Sab Sabota. Corsican, Sabatu. And on and on for 24 examples. Thank you, Carol. Would you mind sending me that link by email? Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Another thing that I'll actually mention along that line is just even the whole, the history of the Sabbath controversy in Christianity. And there was a number of different uh, types of Christians in early centuries that actually kept Saturday and Sunday. And, you know, clearly they, they recognized it as the seventh day and the first day, and then there were those who wanted to get rid of seventh day observance and promote first day observance. And just uh, 
you know, obviously you'd have to look up the the history of that to find, you know, to read the literature, read the ancient literature yourself, but it's there. There's there's books written about the history of the Sabbath and so on. I know Samuel Bakioki wrote some books on it. Jane Andrews had uh, a book about the history of the Sabbath. And just looking at the history of that controversy shows, hey, this day is the seventh day and Sunday is the first day. So any other questions that people may have in relation to the message or uh, things that you wanted to share in regard to things that you're studying, whether Dead Sea Scrolls, Apocrypha, Pseudepigrapha, Priestly Law, uh, whatever the case may be. kind of research Ezekiel 32. Is there any understanding of Ezekiel 32? Optic doesn't seem to have any. Yeah, to my recollection, uh, there hasn't been a um, exposition of it in the writings of modern-day inspiration, if you want to put it like that. Um, Ben Roden may have a little bit more comment on it, uh, but to my recollection, doesn't go through it in in any sort of detail or anything like that. And I have not received any light on the chapter in particular. Um, so I guess that's the answer. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. <laughs> sure. I guess I can just read it and glean what I, what I can see there. Yeah, and you could read it in uh, a few different translations as well, if you have a few around. And, uh, yeah, study it out, see what you find. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, so there's... A number of different directions we can go, of course, if anyone did have anything. Actually, you know what? I think that was a good opportunity to uh, mention a principle. Um, and this is something that is a very practical principle to understand when having meetings like this. Um, there's been a number of times on the meetings where I have mentioned all right, people, you know, feel free to interrupt uh, any time and so on. And um, and then I remember there was one meeting, this was a while ago now, but I remember uh, Norman mentioning something because he had been reading the Dead Sea Scrolls and read in the community rule about not interrupting anyone. And and it, uh, the way the, that... Uh, and I'm not sure if Norman's here quite yet, but if you're here, Norman, the way that you said it uh, would kind of cause me to think of how, um, well, it came across like you just didn't want to interrupt because, hey, it seems like it's pretty bad according to the community rule. <laughs> um, but it's, it's interesting in reading the community rule how it does talk about not interrupting when there is basically what we would call a session. Like there's a, uh, a large meeting with people, you know, entering even according to thousands, hundreds, fifties, tens, and all that. And there's an order in which people can speak. And it says very clearly not to interrupt another. But it does say that if you have anything to say at any point, to stand up, you know, to stand on your feet and to say, I have something to say. And then it can be decided if, you, if the person can speak or not. And so basically, uh, you know, if someone was in the middle of something, they might say, well, not yet, I need to finish this first, and then you can speak. But it, 
even in the um, the discussion in which it is saying not to interrupt, it gives um, a, an organized manner for someone to interrupt to simply say they have something to say. So I wanted to uh, to mention just in terms of the meetings that we have here, when I say feel free to interrupt, um, that means feel free to let it be known if you have something to say. And still, you know, in case anyone's been reading the community rule and they feel like they can't do that, know that even according to the community rule, that it is permissible to let it be known that you have something to say. However, it is also a true principle not to just, you know, let's say someone's talking, they're, they're explaining something, and to just kind of run over them in conversation and to just start talking with whatever you wanted to say right over top without letting them finish. No, if someone has something to say, you know, it wouldn't be good for anyone. Just It's just kind of common courtesy and kindness and uh, affection toward each other to not just run each other over with conversation. But we do have the freedom to say, hey, I have something to say. So I wanted to mention that because we're going to, since no one has had anything to say so far, we're going to get into a few things here. And um, people can feel free to interrupt. And what I mean by that is if you have something to say, let it be known that you have something to say. And um, we'll go from there. So it sounds good. Does anyone have any comments or questions on that before moving forward? This Norman sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, Norman. <laughs> okay, so on that note, I think that's excellent. And um, one of the things that we could continue on here and we, we should continue on this at some point, regardless of where the meeting would go tonight or anything, is continuing on in Leviticus. There are so many important things for us to learn, and we won't really know how all of it comes together for the antitype until we get a thorough understanding of the type, as we've spoken of before. But perhaps before uh, diving into that, just wanted to mention, um, last night we had mentioned that uh, Teresa and myself read First Thessalonians before uh, the meeting. And there were some things in First Thessalonians that were very, very good. Um, and this evening we read Philippians. And once again, Philippians has some very, very good things. Um, and there's a couple things in Philippians that stood out in regard to the priestly law in antitype. And one of them, let me see if I have it correct. I believe it's Philippians 2.17. And uh, this passage... There's one other passage in the New Testament like this. I would have to pull it up to find what it is, but most people here could probably find it without too much trouble. Um, but Philippians 2, let's see, is it 2.17? Yes, it is. Excellent. Paul here says, But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice together with all of you. Okay, so here we have Paul likening himself to a drink offering being poured out on the sacrifice of the faith of the Philippians. So faith is being likened to both a sacrifice and a service, and Paul is being likened to a drink offering being poured out on their faith or on their sacrifice, which is, is very interesting. There's actually a number of other places that 
speak of people as drink offerings. One of them is in the New Testament where Paul refers to himself as being poured out like a drink offering. Another is actually in Psalm 2, um, and this is something that doesn't come through in a lot of translations, but literally it refers to... Uh, and I'll, There's a few aspects. I'm being careful how I'm wording this because I want to convey it in as accurate a way as possible, but I know that there are a number here who have not necessarily gone through our studies on Psalm 2. So I'm going to have to recap just a tiny bit of that. Psalm 2 has two Yahwehs, one which is identified specifically as the son of the other. This is a passage that was used a lot in the New Testament to show Christ as being the son of God. So in Psalm 2, you have two Yahwehs. One is the son, one is the father of the son. And the Yahweh, which is the son, in Psalm 2, says, I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. It reads something uh, either exactly that or very similar to that in the King James Version. But, more literally, it is, I have poured out my king upon my holy mount of Zion, or the holy hill of Zion. I have poured out, or I have libated. It's specifically referring to the king that this Yahweh is, you know, that Yahweh the Son is setting his king upon this holy hill of Zion, and it's specifically referring to that king as being a drink offering. Also, that same verb that's used there uh, to identify that king as a drink offering is actually used in Proverbs 8. I forget the verse specifically. This would have to be looked up uh, to refer to wisdom as a drink offering, where wisdom is poured out. Um, so there you have multiple instances of drink offerings specifically being applied to people in circumstances. Another instance of that, actually, is um, when the mighties of King David went to Bethlehem, uh, obviously when Bethlehem was not being ruled by David, and they went to that well to get water for him because he was thirsty. They risked their lives. And when he got the water back, he poured out the offering. He didn't drink it. He poured out the water as a drink offering to God and says it is equivalent to the lives of these men. So there you have, again, it representing the lives of those men or those men. Um, now, that's not to say that drink offerings cannot represent anything else, but that's a number of instances, again, two times with Paul, once in Psalm 2, once in Proverbs 8, and once in, uh, I forget if it's First or Second Samuel, referring to these mighty. So that's five instances that are actually explaining some sort of meaning to, uh, or some sort of meaning of what a drink offering is. And in all the instances, it is a person being likened to a drink offering. Something interesting to take note of and to investigate further. So that's one of the things in uh, Philippians uh, that we notice that has a bearing on the idea of the anti-typical observance of the law, the symbolic meaning of the ritual service. Um, now, the other thing is actually in Philippians chapter 4, verse 18. But in order to really understand it, you have to go back to verse 10. And so this is what it says, uh, Philippians 4, verses 10 to 18. And bless us with understanding this heavenly family. Thank you. I have great joy in the Lord, because now at last you have again expressed your concern for me. Now I know you were concerned before, but had no opportunity to do anything. 
I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content in any circumstance. I have experienced times of need and times of abundance. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of contentment. Whether I go satisfied or hungry, have plenty or nothing, I am able to do all things through the one who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you did well to share with me in my trouble. And as you Philippians know, at the beginning of my gospel ministry, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in this matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even in Thessalonica, on more than one occasion, you sent something for my need. I do not say this because I am seeking a gift. Rather, I seek the credit that abounds to your account. For I have received everything and have plenty. I have all I need because I received from Epaphroditus what you sent, a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, very pleasing to God. And then it goes on to wrap up the letter. Um, but there Paul is very clearly equating their material offering, whatever it was, whether it was financial or if they sent him some sort of food or clothing or whatever, you know, um, there might be a way historically to determine what exactly it was. But he is specifically equating that material offering as being a fragrant uh, offering, an acceptable sacrifice, very pleasing to God. And this makes sense in a number of regards. Uh, one aspect is that in the typical service, the actual sustenance of the priests was supplied by the offerings of the people. And so in the antitypical service, you find the same thing. Um, also, it's interesting how Paul makes the point that it's not, he doesn't say anything because he's seeking a gift. It's not that he has need. He says, rather, I seek the credit that abounds to your account. So basically, the real sacrifice, the real offering of the sacrifice, wasn't just in the fact that they were supplying the needs of Paul. That was just kind of the result of it. The offering itself was in the act of giving. You know, it was uh, the givers themselves, the act of giving, that was the sacrifice. And it's very interesting how right after this, in verse 19, he says, And my God will supply your every need according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. So you see that Paul, as a result of their giving, was saying, Hey, look, your needs will be met. And one of the things that uh, Teresa mentioned in, when we were reading this is that it almost sounds like they were giving to the point where it's at least in question if, if their needs will be met. So he's reassuring them, God will meet your needs. In other words, it was an actual sacrifice of their own uh, material well-being or their own sustenance on behalf of the gospel. And that was a true sacrifice. So I wanted to mention that because that's another aspect to this whole uh, anti-typical observance of the priestly law. In Romans, Paul actually refers to himself as a priest. We know he's not saying he's a Levitical priest because he, in Philippians, for instance, talks about how he's from the tribe of Benjamin. So he couldn't have been a priest in the typical system. But yet, he was a priest in the antitypical system. This is just another evidence that the system set forth in the gospel is a, a different system, a, a heavenly system. Now, that does actually play on earth as well. It's not 
strictly occurring in heaven, but it's a system in connection with the heavenly sanctuary that is different from the Levitical system. It's keeping the same law. It's not saying, oh, well, in this new system, there's no sacrifices, there's no offerings, there's no this, no that. No, it's keeping the same law, but it's keeping it in a new setting. So this is one aspect. And um, Okay, Teresa found the other reference where Paul refers to himself as being poured out as a drink offering, and that's in 2 Timothy 4.6, for anyone who wants to look that up. And I was thinking here, too, that I should actually find you uh, that reference from Romans where Paul refers to himself as a priest. I'll do that real quick because that's an important thing. Well, while you're doing that, I'm going to read a little bit of this context, if you don't mind, in 2 Timothy 4. Sure. And I'll, so I'll just start from the beginning because it's just six verses. I solemnly charge you before God and Christ Jesus, who is going to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the message. Be ready, whether it is convenient or not. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and instruction. For there will be a time when people will not tolerate sound teaching. Instead, following their own desires, they will accumulate teachers for themselves because they have an insatiable curiosity to hear new things. And they will turn away from hearing the truth. But on the other hand, they will turn aside to myths. You, however... Be self-controlled in all things. Endure hardship. Do an evangelist's work. Fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as an offering, and the time for me to depart is at hand. Very, very interesting context. I found your uh, scripture reference to Paul's saying he was a priest. Yes, excellent. Romans fifteen sixteen. Mm-hmm, that's the one. Would you like to read it? Sure. For me to be the minister of Christ Jesus for the nations, acting as a priest of the evangel of God, that the approach present of the nations may be becoming well received, having been hallowed by the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. So, and I'll, I'll read uh, one aspect of that. Uh, I'll just read most of the verse in the NET as well, because there's one aspect in addition to Paul being as a priest that it brings out here. So he says, I serve the gospel of God like a priest or as a priest, so that the Gentiles may become an acceptable offering sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So uh, quite a clear, clear passage um, that is good for showing the idea of keeping the law. Yes, it's not doing away with priesthood. It's not doing away with offering, but it's keeping it in a different setting. And unfortunately today, most people either are deceived into thinking that the law is done away with, either the priestly law or any aspect of the law, or, if they believe that the priestly law still remains, most people who believe that are looking forward to the reestablishment of the typical system with the shedding of the blood of animals and so on and so forth. When clearly here, and in many, many other places throughout the New Testament, it's an anti-typical system. It's a system of a different priestly order than the Levitical order. And this is another great example. I have a comment. Sure. Uh, Christ is, as we speak, applying his blood to 
the sin in the heavenly sanctuary. So the sacrificial system, the shedding of blood and applying it to the sins to cover the sins, is still in effect. And how could anybody think otherwise? Just because the, the, the model that we had here on the earth, in the earthly sanctuary, it was just that. It was a model of the genuine. Of course, Christ, during its time, Christ was not there serving as high priest, but still the concept is, is valid that, that the genuine is in the heavenly sanctuary. Amen. And, you know, I mean, earlier today we were reading from Spiritual Gifts, uh, the chapter on the sanctuary, and Ellen White so clearly describes it, how she saw the heavenly sanctuary, and she saw the furniture in it, and so on and so forth, and she saw the earthly sanctuary and the, and the furniture in it, and she said that they are the same, that one is a replica of the other, and that the particulars of the service of the earthly sanctuary inform us of Christ's work for us in the heavenly sanctuary. Very, very good statement there in Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1, that is. Um, and I, I wanted to mention, you know, the way that people do deny that truth and the way that people could come to the conclusion that this law isn't really applicable anymore is because they don't um, either accept or know about the reality of a heavenly sanctuary. You know, even though the Christian creeds say that Christ rose in the flesh, they also say that Christ is God and that God is immaterial and dwells everywhere but nowhere in particular. And that heaven is not a physical place. So there is no physical sanctuary. There's no blood being shed. There's no services going. There's no appointed times of intercession or anything like that because all of that is outside of time and outside of space. That's the thought. So that deception has actually kept people from seeing the reality and the applicability of the priestly law today. Yeah, so uh, if no one had any other questions or comments on something else, did anyone have any questions or comments on what we just looked at before moving on? Question. Sure. Okay. Um, so Jesus and Heavenly Family, they have a human too? Because if we really thinking like material, so I mean, you know what I mean, like bleeding. Um, ah, <laughs> uh, no, we know what you mean. Yeah. yeah, no, we're totally clear. Yeah. So the uh, the better way to to look at it, uh, some people when they hear this message and we talk about how our heavenly family is physical and they have real physical bodies. Sometimes people think, oh, you're just making God in your own image. You know, you're just applying the characteristics of humanity to God. When in reality, it's just the opposite. Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 26 and 27 declare very plainly that we are made in the image and likeness of God, or Elohim, which is plural, male and female, and that we, humankind, male and female, were made in their likeness. Um, so what that means is, you know, we can look at our form. There's other places that say that we have the same form as God. He was in the form of God and in the form of man. And uh, we're going to go through a few things in relation to this, actually, in a minute. But, you know, in a technical sense, the members of the Godhead 
uh, I'll say originally were not human <laughs> in the sense that human, we use that word to describe a created being uh, that is of our caliber. You know, we are humans and we are made in the image of our heavenly family. Christ now is human because he became human, but prior to the incarnation, he wasn't human, but he still looks like we do. And we still look like he does. And that's more specifically for the men. Women look like the Holy Spirit, mother and daughter. And thus, when we look at a woman, we can see what they look like. Um, this truth actually, not specifying on the issue of gender, but the fact that our heavenly family or the fact that God has a physical body that literally looks like the body of a human is actually foundational to Adventism. This actually was one of the ideas in Adventism that was really important and was very much ridiculed by other churches, but was a very, very important teaching. And I want to read some or potentially even all of of an article that goes through this. Um, okay. Uh, there's an article by James White. We won't go through this, through this right now, but I want to reference it quickly, called The Personality of God. And it's all about the fact that God has a body. That's the whole purpose of it. And um, the early Adventists, if you ever read in their writings, when they talk about the personality of God, the word personality back in their day didn't mean someone's um, person, uh, personality in the sense of their character traits the fact that they happen to have certain uh, tendencies of thought or whatever the case may be. Their personality is, today we would say, personhood. And you're talking about someone's person as their body. So the personality of God in the writings of the early Adventists is all about the physical body of God. And... Uh, Ellen White, she talks about the personality of God as well, and often people don't understand what she's referring to, but she's talking about the literal body of God. Um, Comment? Yes. Uh, personality, personality, uh, physicality is a, a word uh, you often find in the media, some coined words ending in ality. Well, they all, they all come from the word reality. So when you're calling, speaking of the personality of God, then you're speaking of the real, physical nature. A tangible God. Yeah, I'd have to look that up. I, I haven't ever heard of that, uh, that idea one way or the other. Um, it, 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 it's being overused, to, but but the word it, it, it springs from reality. You know, I can you, you can join the reality to, uh, with with it and see that it fits. My thought would be that the suffix itself has a certain meaning. Mm -hmm. It t. You know, <clears throat> because personal, real, physical, that's the root word, and then it has a suffix on it, I-T-Y. And, you know, in the medical field, there's a lot of Latin. In science, there's a lot of Latin, that sort of thing. And the prefix, the suffix, you know, they all have meaning to them, and then you put these portions together to form a word, and that defines what the word is describing. So as you were bringing that up, my first thought, before you even mentioned, you know, the, the specifics of it all, my thought immediately went to the suffix, the I-T-Y, 
and wanting to know, well, does that itself have a particular meaning? And even it. did it used to. You have it? I have it out of the uh, Funk and Wagnalls Standard Dictionary defines the suffix ity. It's the suffix of nouns. It is the state or quality of the noun. So it's the there you state. Go. Re- reality is the state of being real. There Physicality you go. is the state of being physical. The personality is the state of being a person. Excellent. Mm-hmm. So state, again, it gets back to what we are have learned and are, are trying to uh, ingrain into our thought process. It's the state. It's the condition of being material. It's the material aspect. Is th- does, w- doesn't the word state imply materi- materialism? <laughs> or, I know well, it's, a, yeah. it's a circular logic here I think I'm getting hung up in, but do you <laughs> see what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make is that that it, it, it gives a state, it gives the tangible um, concept of the of the thought. Uh, maybe I'm... Yeah. No, I mean, your point is understood. Um, and in a, you know, when we talk about a real state of something with the understanding of materialism, then we automatically understand that any state that is being spoken of is a material state. However, you can also talk about the the state of something in a conceptual sense. Um, the state of a claim may not be true. Um, the state of you know whatever. So, in other words, you can talk about it conceptually in terms of things that are not talking about the physicality of a particular item or thing, um, but yeah, it's, it is within the understanding of materialism, once that is proven to be true, then, of course, any true state of something is a material state because there's simply nothing else out there. Um, though I don't know if that would be... Uh, I would say that that's not the, the emphasis or the point of, of the suffix, per se, but it's just an understanding that we would have that applies to all things within the understanding of materialism. But one thing, one thing very interesting uh, when you mentioned about personality is the state of being a person. A number of early Adventist articles were called the person of God or personality of God. Different things like that, and they're using it in the same way. Or things like, is God a person? And what they're asking, you know, uh, John Harvey Kellogg, Ellen White said that he was bringing in downable heresies that basically were destroying the truth of the personality of God. And what she was talking about was the physical body of God, the fact that God is a person. Uh, the Adventists objected to pantheism and to the belief of Christendom. And they said that the belief of Christendom does not um, hold that God is a person. Well, you ask any Christian today, and any Christian says, oh yeah, I believe in a personal God. But what they mean by that is that they believe in a social God, a God that interacts with his creation. That's not what the early Adventists were talking about. They're talking about, is God a physical being? And um, so unless, if, if there's any other comments on that before I go into this article, that's fine. Um, but there's an article here that I have to go through if there are no other comments. Okay. So, uh, and... Rachel, this should answer your question pretty clearly from Scripture. Um, 
<laughs> there's a lot of scripture references that are given in the articles that I'm about to mention and go through at least some of it. And so if you want to write down these scripture references or whatever the case may be, um, it will be helpful if you or anyone else here needs to show anyone these truths. So this article, uh, there's actually a couple articles uh, by D.M. Canwright. Now, D.M. Canwright in later years ended up departing from the faith. However, in earlier years, uh, he wrote things like this, which were very well representing the Adventist position and um, Ellen White, you know, supported Canwright and so on and so forth. He was a, a very good uh, proponent of the Advent message, kind of like how John Harvey Kellogg was doing a great work in Adventism, and Ellen White was so supportive of John Harvey Kellogg, and l then later he went off. Same with Jones and Wagner. Unfortunately, this happened time and time again. So these articles, um, the first one, it's a series called The Personality of God by D.M. Canwright. Uh, the first one is in Review and Herald, September 12, 1878. And the second article is Review and Herald, uh, or oh, actually, no, sorry, this is, uh, I'm giving it in reverse order. Uh, the first one is September 5, 1878, also Review and Herald. The Personality of God. I may not read everything here, but I will uh, read at least some portions where there are very notice, uh, notable aspects. And I'll uh, start uh, first with reading from the second article, September 12, um, just because it highlights uh, some other aspects. And the last part of the first article really drives it home, so we'll consider that last. The article starts out with saying, Another convincing proof that God is a real person having a form, and parts is the fact that man is said to have been made in the image of God. Then he quotes Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Dot, dot, dot. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And that's the end of the quote from Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Canwright continues. If man was made in the image and likeness of God, then we know how God looks, what shape he has. He is in the shape of a man. How clear, right? I mean, if we want to know what early Adventists taught, that's, that's very, very clear. Or in the shape of man, not in the shape of a man. He says he is in the shape of man. Um, and at some point, you will all have uh, something which goes through a lot more articles than this. There's many other Adventists who wrote on this topic in uh, equal or at least near equal clarity. And let's see, I'm going to skip forward a little bit here just because we don't want to take the time to read all of both of these articles. That would take some time. Um, what he goes through is to show what it means to be in the image of God. Um, he points out that Genesis 2, 7 says, And the Lord God formed man uh, in the dust of the ground and he points out that he was formed in the image of God before life was breathed into him. Early Adventists pointed this out many times to show how, look, the image of God must be the physical image because he was formed in the, the image of God before he was even made a living being. Um, 
Genesis 9, 6 confirms this fact, Canary says. Whoso sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he him. Okay, so what that is showing us is that shedding of man's blood is in some way defiling the image of God. It has to do with the physical body. Continuing, if a man killed a beast, was he to die for that? No. But if he shed the blood of a man, he must die. The reason is stated, for in the image of God made he man, i.e., he has killed and destroyed that which is made in the image of God. Now the question is, what has he killed? Not an immortal spirit or soul, but the body, that which had blood, that which was in the image of God. Hence, it is the body which is in the image of God. Very, very clear. And then he goes on and gives definitions of image and likeness and examines that further. Uh, and then he comments, he says, um, let us now turn to the Bible and find the meaning of the word image as it is there used. It will be found that every time it refers to something that has a form, a real substance, a shape. And then he goes and quotes many, many different uh, Bible passages that use the word image. And then he summarizes by saying all these texts, abundantly show that in Bible language, an image is something that has a real form and shape. And then he expands on that, quotes uh, more passages. Now let's see. Skipping forward a bit, he quotes Romans 8.3. God, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Here it is definitely stated what part of man constitutes the likeness. Sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. It is his flesh, then, in which the likeness consists. Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8, is absolutely uh, decisive upon this point. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ, uh, sorry, also in Christ, form of God. I think that I'll pull it up. I might have something here. Typo. Yeah, or something Philippians that was what? missed. What's the reference? Uh, Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8. It's the the part where it in says that, yeah, though he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God something to be grasped, or as something to be grasped. So the point of him being in the form of God, I'll have to go and uh, correct the format here for uh, what I'm reading from. Here, we stop to ask, how Christ could be in the form of God if God had no form. But Jesus was in the form of God. Hence, the argument is conclusive that God has a form. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, which is man and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, etc. Here it is declared that Christ was in the form of God, in the form of a servant, in the likeness of man, in the fashion of man. We know that this was his body, for Christ was both in the form of God and in the form of man, then God and man both have the same form. Of Jesus, Paul says, who being the brightness of his glory 
and the express image of his father's person or of his person Hebrews 1 3 it is the person of God then of which Jesus was the image then God has a person now what is the meaning of the word person it seems that on so simple a word as this there could be no mistake it does not and cannot mean an immaterial intangible shapeless formless essence it always means an intelligent being having a body shape and form again we appeal to the Word of God let us carefully read a few plain scriptures where the word person is used and it will be seen that it always means an individual with an organized shape and form now we won't go through and read all these right now I'll just reference some of the verses that he quotes Genesis 1421 numbers 1918 judges 9 5 first Samuel 1618 and I'll stop there he actually quotes many many more but Excuse anyone me. here can yes what was the verse uh, backing up just a, a smidge in there where you were quoting Jesus uh, was in the form of God and the form of a servant and that one sure that's Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 8 okay I have that one written down and then you, it must have all been in there then because okay mm -hmm. I have that. thank you yeah and, and then another significant one is Hebrews 1 verse 3 which says that Christ is the express image of his yes. being his father's person yeah I've got that um, one so so I just uh, I thought there was another one in there but it was all it was all in the uh, five through eight is what it was Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, and um, I just want to mention anyone, if, you know, you could look up if you have any sort of Bible searching software or even just a concordance. You can look up the word person in Scripture or the Hebrew or Greek equivalent and look it up and see. Every time it's a real physical person with body and parts. And Canaray ends his article here by saying, by these passages we find what the Bible means by the word person it never means a being without body parts or passions that's what the creeds say now the Bible after using the word person hundreds of times in the sense indicated above says that God is a person we believe it and are willing to leave it there now to go to the September 5 1878 article by Canwright this is also part of the same series the personality of God we really recommend the whole article uh, it's September 5 1878 review and Herald article by DM Canwright called the personality of God this is how it starts God is a real person having a body form and local habitation man is made in his image the God of the Bible is not a mere principle an essence or soul of the universe but he is a real personal being having a body form shape and local habitation a throne etc but let us listen first to what the creeds say of him the Methodist discipline in its article of religion or articles of religion article 1 says so this is quoting the Methodist Creed there is but one living and true God everlasting without body or parts the articles of faith of the Episcopal Church are even worse 
Article 1 says, There is but one living and true God, everlasting, without body, parts, or passions. Other creeds go still further and say that he is without center or circumference. In all candor, I submit that such a description of God annihilates him entirely. He has no body, no parts, no passions, dwells nowhere in particular, has no center, no circumference. If a man were called to describe a non-entity, he could not do it more perfectly than it is done in the above language. But notice further, these same creeds teach that Jesus Christ is the very and eternal God. Thus, Article 2 of the Episcopal Creed says, The Son, which is the Word of the Father, begotten from everlasting of the Father, the very and eternal God, of one substance with the Father, etc. Now notice that this Son of God is the very and eternal God himself. And then it continues, took man's nature in the womb of the Blessed Virgin, of her substance, so that two whole and perfect natures, that is to say, the Godhead and manhood, were joined together in one person, never to be divided, whereof is one Christ, very God and very man. Article 4 says, Christ did truly rise again from the dead and took again his body with flesh, bones, and all things pertaining to the perfection of man's nature, wherewith he ascended into heaven, and there sitteth until he return to judge all man at the last day. Now, that's the end of the quote from the creeds. Several queries present themselves here. Is Christ the very and eternal God? So they say. Did Christ have a body? This they positively affirm. Is he inseparably connected with that body? And has he not that body in heaven? This they plainly declare. Is he not the true God? So they say. Then, has not the true God a body? This, the creed directly says, then certainly God has a body, occupies a body. Why then do the creeds say that he has no body? Again, we are told by these creeds that God is everywhere, as much in one place as another, and no more in one place than another. But the Bible says that Jesus ascended up on high and is at the right hand of the Father. Did he ascend everywhere? Was his body divided into innumerable particles and scattered throughout the universe? If the Father is everywhere and nowhere in particular, where did Jesus go? Again, it is claimed that saints at death go to heaven where God is. Do they go everywhere? and nowhere in particular? All this seems to me to be the sheerest nonsense. It is opposed to common sense and to the Bible. No, God is a person, a real being. I do not believe that any person, whatever his creed may be, ever prays to God without conceiving of him as having a body, form, and shape being located upon a throne in heaven. When he closes his eyes upon the world and begins to pray to God, he immediately looks up to heaven by faith and beholds God upon his throne in the form of a man and prays to him as such. Nor is this merely imaginary. The Bible has everywhere so described him. And it is from these oft-repeated descriptions that these ideas are formed. Then either the whole tenor of the Bible misleads us, or else our position is true. Furthermore, how could a person pray with any intelligence 
to a mere essence, a mere principle, and an immaterial spirit that had no body, parts, or shape, that was just as much in one place as in another. The idea is absurd. Then again, what the Bible says of going to God and coming takes for granted that he is a personal being located in a definite place. Let us read a few scriptures. And then he quotes a number of scriptures which speak of going to and coming from God. He quotes quite a number, so we're not going to read it, but I'll reference a few. John chapter 20, verse 17. John chapter 7, verse 33. Revelation 12, 5. Acts chapter 10, verse 4. John chapter 8, verse 42. John chapter 13, verse 3. And John 16, verse 28. Now, it's interesting how the last verse says, I came from the Father and am come into the world Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. And Canwright emphasizes uh, that verse because it's so specific. Uh, and I'm going to skip ahead here because he goes into a number of other aspects dealing with the personal presence of God in a particularly located space. And then he talks about God sitting on a throne and so on. So I'm going to skip ahead quite a bit. Okay. The scriptures describe God as a person, having a form, the shape of a man. Daniel, in his vision of God, describes him thus. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. And that's Daniel 7, verse 9. Canwright continues, God is here described as having a head and hair. Ezekiel, in his vision of the throne of God, says, And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above it. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it. From the appearance of his loins, even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Ezekiel 1, verses 26 to 28. This is the living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the river Kebar. Ezekiel 10, 20. So very, very clear. Uh, Canaanite continues. To Moses, the Lord said. Now this is uh, first quoting from Exodus 33, verses 20 to 23. Now this is very, very significant. Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cleft of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away my hand, and thou wilt see my back parts." but my face thou shalt not see. Exodus 33, verses 20 to 23. Canwright, commenting on this, says, No man can see the Lord's face. Then he has a face. But he said, I will put thee in a cleft of the rock, and will pass by, and thou shalt see my back parts. And he did so. Now, was, all, was this all a farce, a deception? Did the Lord deceive Moses and make him think he had a face and hands 
and parts when he had none? No, indeed. Then God has parts, notwithstanding the creeds say he is without body or parts. Now, he quotes Exodus 24, verses 9 to 11, which says that Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work. So he quotes that, and says, Here it is positively declared that they saw the God of Israel. It tells what was under his feet, and how he looked. They saw his shape and form, but did not see his face, for God has said that no man should see his face and live. Now, this is the last paragraph of the article, and I want everyone to pay very close attention to what it is saying. And to know that this, again, this is the Review and Herald, September 5, 1878. This is Adventism to its core. All through the scriptures, God is described as a being in the form of man. Thus, he is said to have a head and hairs of his head, Daniel 7, 9, and hands, Exodus 33, verse 22, feet, Exodus 24, verse 10, loins, Ezekiel 1, verse 27, face, Matthew 18, verse 10, hearth, uh, Genesis 6, verse 6, parts, Exodus 33, verse 23, a Form, Philippians 2, verse 6. Shape, John 5, 37. Person, Hebrews 1, 3. Soul, Jeremiah 5, 9. And Spirit, Matthew 12, 28. Thus, it is declared that God has all the members and parts of a perfect man. This is not said once, not twice, but many times. Not in parables and symbols and figures, but directly and plainly. And that's how Canwright ends his article. So I think that that does two things very wonderfully. It shows what the early Adventist position was, quite plainly. And that's supported by many, many other articles, by many other Adventists. And also what it does is shows very directly the scripture teaching on the subject and that it is, in fact, the same as what the early Adventists taught. That God is indeed a real being with body, with parts, that he has all the parts of a man, all, all, the, yeah, all the members and parts of a perfect man. It even describes that he has loins. The early Adventists did not believe that God was beyond gender, nor did they believe that he was beyond space and time. The writers of the various books of the Bible did not believe that God was beyond gender. And they did not believe that he was beyond space and time. No, God is everywhere in inspiration described as a real physical being with body, parts, and gender. So I hope that that's helpful. Uh, yeah, excellent. So I just want to clarify, you know, the yoga thing, they talk about body, mind, and spirit. So basically, it's all, it's right, right? So we have all body, mind, spirit. Like the clean body and our Christ, mind, and Holy Spirit in a holy person. That's my question. Okay, um, I'll repeat what I'm understanding you to be asking, and you let me know if I'm understanding you correctly. Um, you're basically, you're asking... Uh, if we have body, mind, and spirit, 
Is that the question, or is it if also the members of the Godhead do as well? Wait, say that again. Uh, is your question if we have body, mind, and spirit, or are you also asking if the members of the heavenly family also have body, mind, and spirit? Uh, <laughs> if the heavenly family has it, that means we also have it. Can I say that? If the heaven, yes, yes, that's a fair statement. But here's the thing. You were mentioning yoga and how yoga promotes the uh, integration of body, mind, and spirit. They see those as three different things. I think your question is, are those three different things or are they the same thing? Is that your question? Oh, okay. Now I you see what I meant. Oh, before I thought the yoga integration thing was three in one. So I agree with the three in one theory. So then I asked you guys if you agree with that. Okay, okay. I think I understand your question now. If we agree with basically what yoga is saying about the three in one idea. Um, so I'm not all familiar with the various aspects of the philosophy behind yoga in all of its aspects, but I know that it promotes an immaterial view of the idea of mind and spirit. So here's the thing. In order to correctly understand that, we have to know what each of these things individually are. So Often today, when we think of the word spirit, people today think that that is something that they have within them that's kind of like um, a a non-physical part of them that is responsible for um, our relationship with God or... um, Us having life us having life or being uh, into spirituality, that sort of thing. And people think that our mind is, is just our intellect and, and then our, our spirit is something, something else that is an immaterial part of us. Um, but in Scripture, a spirit is never uh, some sort of non-physical part of us. It's not that we have a spirit that is, um, uh, what's the best way for me to put it? The, perhaps the best way for me to, to describe it is just simply the way it really is. We are physical beings and we have thoughts which are the, the product or the, uh, the process of our physical brain. It's not like there's some other thing in us, whether you call it a spirit or a soul. Different people have different definitions for those things. It's not that we have something like that in us that is doing the thinking or that is responsible for our relationship with God or anything like that. We, as as a whole, are one thing. And a good way, I think, that might help us to understand this, this is kind of a little bit of a reality check for people. Um, Let me see if I can just pull something up here quick. Okay. I'm looking for a passage in Ecclesiastes that says something... Very interesting. Okay. Now, the NET doesn't translate this as literally, unfortunately, but it's uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 18. I also thought to myself, it is for the sake of people so God can clearly show them that they are animals, is a more literal way. Or 
I think in King James it says they are beasts. Um, but literally, in scriptures, and this verse in Ecclesiastes is, is perhaps the most direct reference, people are actually animals. You know, it's, it's not that, you know, Christians object to that because they want to think that, well, the difference between us and animals is that we have a soul or we have a spirit, when really they are animals and we are animals too. It's just what we are. And just as they don't have some sort of immaterial part of them, some non-physical essence that dwells inside of them, neither do we. We don't have anything like that because nothing like that even exists. Uh, people think that we have a soul. In Scripture, it says that God breathed into man and he became a living soul. Um, it also says that animals are living souls of, of the other animals. That is something important to understand. Animals actually have thoughts, too. And um, even like chimpanzees and so on can, can learn and understand many, many different words in English or any other human language. They have thoughts, we have thoughts. Our thoughts are more defined by our languages and in many senses more advanced. But it's still thoughts, the same way that they have thoughts. And it doesn't take a, a non-physical part of us or anything like that. Um, the spirit in Scripture, when it talks about our spirit, it uses it in a few different ways, but many times it's referring to our will. As in, it's who... Uh, our will is basically our ability to choose. And our will can be also uh, describing the pattern of our choices, what we have set it in our minds to do, the way we have purposed our hearts, the way we have chosen... Um, that's our will. Um, when it talks about stirring up the spirit of Joshua, son of Josedek, and Zerubbabel in Haggai, stirring up their spirit is stirring up their will um, and the will of the people, the spirit of the people. Our mind is our way of thinking. Our soul is a way of describing in Scripture our soul is our whole being. It's our whole being, including our body and everything. Adam became a living soul. Often in, in uh, Scripture, when it uses the word soul, lots of translations just say myself. Like if it says my soul, it's myself. Because that's what it's talking about. It's our, it's our whole person, our whole being. Um, so all of those aspects make up who we are. Our soul is basically the entirety of ourself. Um, it's used metaphorically sometimes. Like if you read uh, Ellen White, sometimes she uses the word soul in a different sense, metaphorically. Um, or like the soul's longing. And even there, it's kind of the whole being, but she's talking about our innermost thoughts sometimes when she uses the word soul. But in Scripture, in Genesis, for instance, um, the soul is the whole being, the spirit is the will, the mind is the way of thinking, and we use the, the word body to refer to the actual parts that, that make us up and that produce our thoughts, our, you know, the processes of that particular body part i.e. the brain. So does that kind of help to set the framework for understanding that? Oh, yeah. Great. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Heavenly Family. Did anyone else have any thoughts or comments on that? Question. Sure. Are you familiar with uh, what Ken Wright was writing uh, about the same time on the nature of the Holy Spirit? 
Yes. Can Write was, in fact, I, the series of articles that this is a part of is also very much anti-Trinitarian, and he attacks the doctrine of the Trinity on multiple fronts, um, both in regard to the idea of the Holy Spirit being a person and in regard to uh, the idea of Christ being very God. Um, so yes, he was definitely anti-personality of the Holy Spirit, as were some of the other pioneers, such as Uriah Smith. Right. Yeah. Although not all the pioneers were anti-personality of the Holy Spirit. Um, pretty much all of them were anti-Trinitarian, although some of them, their arguments focused just on the nature of Christ and the nature of the Father. Um, and just basically avoided the question of the Trinity. And in fact, uh, J.H. Wagner, E.J. Wagner's dad, he explained the overall position of Adventism on the Holy Spirit. Um, and he actually wrote a book on the Holy Spirit. Let me just pull this up here. Okay. Hmm. Okay, I think I found it here. Okay. So this is uh, from J. H. Wagner in a book that he called "The Spirit of God," and he he mentions what the the general approach of Adventists has been or was at the time he wrote this concerning the nature of the Holy Spirit. He says this, There is one question which has been much controverted in the theological world upon which we have never presumed to enter. It is that of the personality of the Spirit of God. So notice, he's just saying we have never presumed to enter upon this subject, that of the personality of the Spirit of God. Again, in early Adventist terminology, personality is talking about physical body. Um, he says, prevailing ideas of person are very diverse, often crude, and the word is differently understood. So that unity of opinion on this point cannot be expected until all shall be able to define precisely what they mean by the word, again, the word person, or until all shall agree upon one particular sense in which the word shall be used. But as this agreement does not exist, it seems that a discussion on the subject cannot be profitable, especially as it is not a question of direct revelation. In other words, they had received no direct light on it. We have a right to be positive in our faith and our statements only when the, the words of Scripture are so direct as to bring the subject within the range of positive proof. So he basically points out there that they're not engaging in the question of the personality of the Holy Spirit because they don't see it clearly revealed and because no one seems to really know what the word person means. There's no consensus on that. So what's the use in entering into debate regarding it when people are using the word so diversely? So what the Adventists instead try to do is to explain what the word person means, which they did many, many times in their articles on the personality and personhood of God. Um, with that understanding, shortly after Canwright wrote against the idea of the Holy Spirit being a person, having a personality, and a couple other Adventists did as well, Ellen White wrote that the Holy Spirit is indeed a person as much as God is a person. Very, very interesting. She over and over again, Ellen White agreed with the pioneers on the, the personality of the Father 
and of the Son, and of their relation one to another, that Christ is not the Lord God Almighty, that he is not God as to who he is, but as to what he is, he is God. He is the Son of his Father, the literally begotten Son. When it came to the Holy Spirit, she said the nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. And then she started to have some light. And when she did, it was that the Holy Spirit is as much a person as God is a person. That means that the Holy Spirit has a body. No mistaking that when you look at what early Adventists wrote concerning what a person is. That means that the Holy Spirit has a body with parts and has a particular form form, and shape. And so that automatically opens up the question of gender, although, of course, that was not something that was asked in her day. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Okay. Well, we've been on for some time now, and I think we've covered some good and important things. Um, I just want to say, perhaps in closing, that materialism is such an important truth. It's something that we all need to settle into. We need to understand the implications of materialism to know what it really means, and to have our minds reorganized according to that truth. And last night, actually, was part of that, the discussion that we had then. The reason why it is so important is because it defines for us what truth is. What is even the idea of truth? Materialism is what tells us that. And through the understanding of materialism, we then are enabled to understand every other truth. So it is extremely significant and um, in many ways will be the deciding factor for whether people will stand on the side of truth or not. And if you want to understand a little bit about what that's about, uh, you can look up some of what Ellen White talks about in regard to spiritualism in the last days. All right, would anyone like to volunteer to close with prayer? us off here with prayer. Heavenly Family, thank you so very much for the precious truths of reality. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for the questions that have been asked and thank you for not leaving us in the dark concerning these things, but for giving us real answers and for not only giving us the answers, but giving us evidence in support of these answers. Thank you, Heavenly Family. Please bless each person here. Help them to comprehend the truth. Help us to comprehend the truth and to settle into it and to have our minds totally revolutionized and renewed that we may reflect your character in its full glory as much as possible at each moment that we may witness to the world of who you are. Thank you, Heavenly Family. 
Let your will be done. Let your kingdom come. Amen. Thank you. We ask these things, Father, Mother, in the name of your children, Branch. Amen. Amen. Amen.